Hello and welcome to the 35th annual Norris and Marjorie Bendetson Epic International, International Symposium on Preventing Genocide and Mass Atrocities. My name is Jacob Kirsch and I'm a junior studying international relations and economics. I will be moderating tonight's panel, Never Again and Again and Again, Causes of Genocides and Mass Atrocities. First off, I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us. In order to prevent future genocides and mass atrocities, it is critically important to understand why they happen. So it seems appropriate to begin the symposium with a big picture discussion of the underlying root causes of these atrocities. Specifically, I would like to consider these causes through the frameworks of identity-based conflict and socioeconomic strife. Many mass atrocities come at the intersection of issues of identity as well as socioeconomic issues. In this panel, we will look at the convergence of these issues and how they can independently or jointly cause mass atrocities. Before I introduce our panelists, I wanna first explain how the panel will be run. Each panelist will deliver opening remarks for five minutes. After the opening remarks, the panelists will have a 10 minute discussion, following which the panelists will split into breakout rooms moderated by my peers, Sebastian, Hightone, and Connor. The links to these breakout rooms will be posted in the chat. Now that we've gotten all of that out of the way, allow me to introduce our first panelist. Joining us from Scotland, Donald Bloxham is the Richard Paris Chair of European History at the University of Edinburgh. He is known for his numerous publications focusing on the Holocaust, the Armenian Genocide, and the post-World War II war crimes trials. His current projects include working on a manuscript on the role of moral evaluation in the historian's confrontation with the past, as well as co-editing a diary of a Nuremberg prosecutor. Dr. Bloxham, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Jacob. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's um, been involved in organizing my participation and inviting me. And thank you to everyone who's bothered to tune in to listen to this. It's, it's great to be virtually there. Um, so I know that um, Professor Cox will be talking a little bit in a little bit more detail about issues of identity and specifically about racism. Perhaps I'll pick up a little bit more on the socioeconomic aspects um, when we're talking about causation, and really, I like the title of this uh, of this this panel: "Causation of Genocide and Mass Atrocities." And in some sense, it my my feeling is that genocide studies has got into a bit of a into a bit of a rut, it taps into a bit of a dead end. Um, well, depending on upon how tightly or how how preoccupied it is with the definition of genocide. Thankfully, we seem to be moving away from that a, bit, a little bit, but there is still a concern with whether things fall into the category of the G word or not. And I'm not increasingly uncertain that that's a desperately useful way to approach things, especially since in so many instances, we see genocide emerging alongside or out of other sorts of atrocities that we might categorize slightly differently. But in, in, in other instances, we might also choose to categorize something that's a simultaneous genocide and does something else. One could equally, I think, put um, what we could reasonably call genocide in Nigeria during the Biafra conflict and genocide in East Pakistan um, in 1971. We could, we could quite reasonably call both of those incidents genocide, but we could also call them secession conflicts. Um, and calling them one is not to preclude calling them the other, but there's an awful lot of scholarship on secession conflicts and there's an awful lot of scholarship on genocide and there's only a partial intersection between those two things. And it seems to me that a lot of um, I think genocide studies could really fruitfully engage with, and, and is starting to do so, with a whole body of scholarship that deals with things that don't necessarily instantly fall under the rubric of the G word. I'm thinking of a great deal of political science literature on civil wars. Um, there is a significant propensity in civil war to, to tend towards total targeting of the other side in the civil war, in, in the civil war which lends itself um, to... to indiscriminate violence against population groups. This may or may not pass whatever bar is ne deemed necessary to have the label genocide attached, but it's clearly in some sense related to genocide. It certainly falls under the rubric of mass atrocities. Mm -hmm. That said, there are also very different sorts of mass atrocities. Uh, if one thinks of, um, for instance, the Stalinist case, it's a totalitarian regime like the Nazi regime. And yet, unlike the Nazi regime, well, the, Stalin, the Stalinist regime contrives to kill millions of people, um, but it does them it does that in a rather different way to the way that the Hitler regime does. There's much less 
relatively speaking, much less direct mass murder in the Stalin regime, much more um, exposure to conditions where death is, is likely, if not inevitable, in the gulag system and beyond. The sorts of mass executions we see in Katyn um, during the, the, Nazi, the Soviet occupation of Poland um, in the run-up to the Second World War is relatively unusual in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Soviet system. Mass executions are, are there and they're, and they're large scale, but compared to the death that comes from massive socio-economic reorganization, things like the famine, or the massive use of the, of, of the penal gulag in, uh, archipelago, the much greater cause of death are, the, are death from structurally imposed conditions. We can very reasonably, and I think I would call those mass atrocities, but they clearly merit a very different sort of explanation to the sort of explanation that might come as a result of, of civil war. So even when we broaden out genocide to include mass atrocities, there are still, I suppose, definitional issue, issues because there are so many different sorts of mass atrocity. And we're on a fool's errand if we look for one grand overarching explanation, I think, for, for, for this whole kind of complex of nasty things. One has to look, in the Soviet case, at the specificities of um, communist regimes looking for massive swift industrialization, socio-economic advance, uh, with a contempt for the peasantry uh, and a, a certain contempt for human life full stop. Um, that's a very different sort of set of considerations, I think, to the overtly racist considerations of uh, uh, exterminatory war in, in the East that comes from the Nazi perspective. Different again are many of the, of the, of the civil wars that we see, even though I th still think there's a great deal that genocide studies could learn from the study of civil wars. Um, especially in the post-colonial context, to think of socio-economic causes, um, the legacy in a whole series of countries from Chad, Sudan, Nigeria, um, legacies of unequal um, development across in different areas of those states, East Pakistan, Pakistan too, um, legacy, you know, bequeathed legacies of differential colonial investment, um, giving one region a socio-economic advance, advantage over another. And often those regional differences are sort of overlapped with, with ethnic differences too. Um, but that said, it's very, very rare, really, for, for civil wars to occur purely on the basis of ethnic difference. As Jacob, I think, quite rightly in, uh, intimates, there has to be a sort of intersection of causality there, where well, you, might, you might, I think, in social science parlance, we would talk about horizontal inequalities, you know, different different um, ethnic groups within the same society either having or being seen to perceive to have some kind of intrinsic material advantage over others. When that intrinsic advantage is also kind of layered in terms of regions of historical underinvestment versus historical overinvestment, we see the core, you know, grievance causes for civil wars. We might also see grievance, uh, the possibility of causation for secession as well. If one especially well endowed region thinks it'd be better off going on its own, or thinks it's been historically repressed and would be better off going on its own, then we see, you know, cause for state breaking or state reinforcing violence or the sort of violence that comes about, you know, civil war coming about from a, co a combination of identity and resource-based conflicts. So I think all of those things need to, I suppose a lot of these things move us away a bit from the classic genocide paradigm, which does rather have the Nazi genocide and the Holocaust as, as, it, as its paradigm, you know, for very good reasons, because of the extremity of that event. But if we're looking at the world as it is now and has been since, since the Second World War, um, you know, I think the most likely sorts of atrocities, the most common sorts of atrocities are going to be those that fall at this nexus of uh, development related issues as they cross over with civil war, secessional conflict, and so on and so forth. I suspect that's my time up. Um, is that right, Jacob? That is correct. All right. Thank you, Professor Bach. <coughs> um, our next panelist is the director of the Center for the Study of Mass Violence at Rutgers University, Manus Midlarski. His books on genocide and political violence have earned widespread praise, including recent works such as The Killing Trap, Genocide in the 20th Century, and Origins of Political Extremism, Mass Violence in the 20th Century and Beyond. His most recent publication, Genocide and Religion in Times of War, focuses on the critical roles of religious differences in wars as enablers of genocide. Professor Midlarski. Thank you, Jacob. Appreciate the generous introduction. Um, so I'm a political scientist and my field is international relations. That's my specialization. 
And so I suppose it's natural for me to come at the issue of genocide from an international perspective. Um, and so I'm going to talk about some of the issues that generate uh, genocidal uh, events that happen particularly in wartime. And, and it's not just civil wars, as uh, Donald Bloxham correctly pointed out. It is interstate wars as well. And the interstate wars in particular that were so deadly uh, uh, for, let's say, the Holocaust, World War I and ongoing World War II when the genocide began. So what in particular distinguishes the genocidal perpetrator in this instance? And what I found is that experience of loss, um, territorial in particular, it can also be personal, um, and, and there's a lot of work that, that still needs to be done on this, but the genesis of the Holocaust happened after World War I, after Germany lost much of its territory in Europe, as well as its colonies. And, and these territories were, were central. Uh, Western Poland, for example, uh, Posen and Poznan, of course, now uh, under Polish rule. And so the impact of these losses became central to Nazi ideation. And then, of course, there were the personal losses of, the, of both the inflation after World War I, where um, carts of, of Deutschmarks were brought to pay the, the salary of workers because the, each individual mark was worth so little. And to buy a loaf of bread, you might need half that, that cart of, of, of Deutschmarks. Uh, so that combination of personal loss and territorial loss um, was a condition that, that really enabled the Nazis to take power. And then we look at the Soviet uh, case, uh, and in particular, the Russian Federation, where Putin comes to power. And one of the first things he does is to actually commit a genocide against the Chechens, Roughly 20% of the Chechen population was destroyed in the two wars between 1994 and uh, 2000. So that territorial loss was immense there too, where, where the Soviet Union collapsed. As Putin said, it was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, this, this transformation of this huge Soviet Union to something smaller, namely the Russian Federation. We look at um, Rwanda and, and, and we see in Rwanda also a case of territorial loss that took place when the RPF, the Rwandese Patriotic Front, invaded and took over substantial territories in uh, Rwanda. And it was after that territorial loss that the Rwanda genocide occurred. In Cambodia, it was a similar relationship with Vietnam. Vietnam was gradually encroaching on Cambodian territory. And ultimately, interestingly, even though it was called an autogenocide because so many Cambodians were killed in, in that genocide uh, who were ethnic Khmer, um, the first to be killed were the Vietnamese and they were totally eliminated with a small Vietnamese patient, uh, population uh, in Cambodia after those losses, both of people uh, to the uh, engaging in war of the Vietnamese invading slowly and the territorial loss. Um, so these losses really confer a kind of almost sanctity on the effort to make up for them, to revenge them, to um, uh, the, the war against uh, uh, the, the Jews, for example, for their treasonous activity, presumed treason, treason of, treason of I, I just saw I've got my one minute, one minute warning. Uh, a presumed treasonous activity in, in, in World War I, the infamous stab in the back, which of course never occurred. Um, and, and so um, I, I suppose uh, in that minute, I'll, I'll simply, I am pointing out this one, I think one salient element. There are many others as, as Donald has pointed to, as I'm sure uh, John will, uh, but uh, uh, when they come together, it's really bad. 
and but even in and of themselves individually, they have import. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Midlarski. Um, our final panelist, John Cox, is the director of the Center for Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights Studies at University of North Carolina, Charlotte. He recently published To Kill a People, Genocide in the 20th Century, a book focusing on the intersection between modern genocide and racism. He's currently working on a project titled Rebellion and Resistance in the Nazi Empire, Fighting Hitler, Fighting for a New World, in addition to co-editing co numerous books on genocide. Professor Cox? Yeah, thank you very much. And I'd like to spend more time thanking everyone, but uh, the clock is running. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to speak very quickly. All right. And, uh, but this is a marvelous effort that y'all have uh, uh, undertaken. And I know it's been difficult when with postponements and everything, and it's a great pleasure to be here. And it's, it's also great to hear my, my two colleagues speak first, because that helps me to tie in some things without uh, du duplicating things. But so what, what I'm going to uh, focus on in my very brief few minutes is uh, one factor that I think is really essential, an essential ingredient in genocide in modern times in the last couple of hundred years. It's not the only factor. It intersects. I'm, I'm also really glad that Donald Manas explained that there's, no, there's never one single cause that things intersect. And I also really appreciate Donald's um, thoughts about um, not drawing hard borders around between genocide, mass atrocities, crimes against humanity, and so on, because all these things are, uh, you know, blend into one another. It depends on how it define how one defines something, and it's not. It doesn't help a victim um, of an atrocity to know whether or not they're a victim of a genocide or a crime against humanity, a war crime, or an atrocity, and so on. And the dynamics are the same, or that is the dynamics flow into one another and so on. And so, for example, in my classes, I talk a lot about American atroc uh, uh, genocidal American warfare in Vietnam. And I don't even feel necessarily compelled to put the big G word on top of the entire war effort, although I actually have no problem doing that. But to me, it's more effort. To, it's more worthwhile to talk about the, the facts and to talk about what happened and how it fits in uh, well, et cetera. Okay. So right now, though, I just want to take my last three and a half minutes to speak about the factor of racism and invention of Europeans and eventually other white people over the last 500 years that became especially a key ingredient in uh, genocidal violence. Uh, yeah, well, in particular, over the last century and a half or so. And so, um, and I'll just say very quickly that a couple, there are many ways in which it does that. One way that's obvious is it's a lot easier to kill someone. If you're a Nazi murderer in Poland or, or a, an American murderer in Vietnam, if you regard them as an inferior race and so on. But then also racism inevitably was tied in with ideas about nationality and who's indigenous and who's not and so on. And so for example, the genocide of violence in Rwanda in 1994 was based on ideas of racism brought there by Europeans a hundred years earlier that taught, among other things, that one group, the Tutsi, were not, were not, not only a separate race, but were also uh, not indigenous to the region. And this is also a factor in a couple of things that Dr. Uh, Midlarski pointed to about ter uh, territorial loss. That was often tied in also with ideas of, um, um, of the, uh, the, the inferior race that you imagine being tied to outside threats. So for example, the very, very, very small population of Vietnamese people in Cambodia being regarded as being tied to a massive external threat. The rather small Armenian population in the Ottoman Empire being uh, seen as being tied to an external threat because they were not part of the race that was uh, being constructed and fortified. Just say a couple other words I'll say is that um, it probably doesn't sound too shocking to anyone here, to students in general, to say that racism is a factor in genocide. But then we often then think immediately of Nazi genocide and other things. But to non-specialists, it's it, to non-specialists, it's surprising to hear that racism imported by the Europeans was a key factor in the Cambodian genocide in the second half of the 70s, in the Rwandan genocide of 1994, where uh, Belgians and others had brought full-blown, really wild ideas about uh, racism, and the origins of the Tutsi people, and so on. But then also in what one could call episodes of, well, of uh, things that uh, 
that sometimes have a, an appearance of uh, some character of the Civil War and so on, including in the Spanish Civil War, and then also in Bosnia and in elsewhere in, as Yugoslavia was being destroyed in the early 1990s, very powerful and strong ideas of racism. And in the case of Yugoslavia, ideas in sort of nationalist mythology that had been, had held sway for many centuries, um, helped to fuel the genocide of violence there. In the case of Spain, believe it or not, there were people who cooked up some ideas about how communism was a genetic, uh, <laughs> a genetic matter. There was one person in particular who developed a theory of, the, of a red gene and so on. And so in fact, and actually why not? Because race itself is completely a fiction, something com completely invented by human beings. And so therefore is quite malleable. Okay, I know I'm running out of time, but I'll just say lastly, um, that um, I thought about focusing on this, especially in the last four and a half months, because as well as anyone who's lived in the United States for most of their life, one must be, one must take the, assume the obligation of learning and being vigilant about racism and combating racism. And yet, as much as I've done that throughout my adult life, when I saw the video four and a half months ago of the public lynching of a man named George Floyd, it was especially shocking and even though I couldn't even watch the video, but the clips I saw of it also just, I, it, it, something that struck me was that I was seeing the face of genocide, the c c capacity and potential of genocide of violence. And you know, genocide starts somewhere. It doesn't start with a massive army and you know, the Nazi army and uh, you know, uh, invading Russia in 1941. It starts or it's perpetuated or it's pot potential is perpetuated in all kinds of ways. And if you could just even just have seen a little bit of the facial expressions of the murderer in that video, uh, the murder of George Floyd, then you could see a combination of the arrogance, the feelings of racial superiority, the feelings of how dare you even live here in my country and so on. Martin Luther King once said something like uh, that the logic of racism is genocide because if you believe that the very essence and the very being of other people is inferior then obviously it's not going to be a huge step toward genocidal violence in time. It doesn't take too much of a spark. Um, that is a spark by which I mean a social crisis or whatever to go in that direction. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Cox. And again, thank you to all of our panelists for helping us set the stage for this discussion. Um, I'd first like to ask the panelists if you have any questions for each other um, for our period of, our brief period of discussion. I have uh, one for, uh, for John, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> sometimes the personal element also enters into it. And I'm going to talk now about the uh, George, George Floyd thing where the cop who had his uh, knee on uh, Floyd's neck and what, eight minutes or so. Apparently there was some sort of personal element there. They both worked in the same bar as, as bouncers or whatever, and they had, they had a falling out. And I'm wondering to what extent when racism is combined with that personal element, it gets so magnified that a, 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 an open murder can occur. Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question because that's something too. And uh, yeah, maybe Donna might have something to say on this too about because there's definitely been some literature and genocide studies in recent years about uh, the phenomena of neighbors murdering neighbors and so on. And, um, and at a more kind of superficial level, although I still often believe that when you know someone, it's harder to kill them. Although maybe that's in a more general way. Like if one knows, uh, if you have many Muslim friends then it's much more difficult to accept Islamophobic uh, propaganda and rubbish from your uh, head of state. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and it's in many countries. <laughs> okay, but uh, uh, anyway, I'm not sure. That's I, I don't have a real quick answer off the top of my head. I'll just say that that was, of course, one of the most vexing problems in R Rwanda, for example, which was a case where people had been turned into races by the Belgians. Of course, that's also a lot different, I guess, than the American experience because they didn't really, in fact, it's a little bit more like the Yugoslav experience. 
where for some generations, people didn't really think of themselves as being distinctly different peoples or races, but yet there was a kind of a reservoir that could be drawn upon later. I think that the uh, Belgians were building and they were gonna do it better than the Germans who had governed Rwanda earlier, where the Germans had some of this identity, identity stuff that they foisted on the Tutsi and Hutu, but the Belgians went beyond them and made it an almost uh, impenetrable barrier between them, despite the fact that intermarriage was, had been ongoing between the two groups for quite a while. Thank you. Um, so I guess I would now like to pose a question to all of the panelists. Um, how does the political stability of a state and its institutions contribute to the risk of mass atrocity occurring? I'll, I'll try a uh, um, essay, essay a response. It's very important. Uh, political stability is, is a major issue. And in fact, at one point, the US government had a state failure task force that was established and it, and it, it ranked countries in terms of their state failure. Now it's called the political instability task force. Um, so these are countries to watch. Uh, Rwanda was certainly one, one case in point. Um, I don't think we realized that Russia, the Russian, Federations was, Russian Federation was quite as unstable as it was at the time that Putin took over, but it was. If you look at the indices that I've been looking at recently of, of, of the economy and, and of, of people's views of the government. So that, yeah, political instability is very important and it doesn't have to lead to genocide, but it certainly can be an outcome. Well, I think uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, much will depend upon the state of the institutions that you have in in situ to deal with instability. I mean, there are all sorts of different forms of instability, some of which are the essence of democratic politics, aren't they? And uh, in the sense of competing views about which way you might go, and you know, often very vibrant and and even angry argument about that. Something about the depth of institutions and in civil society that's capable capable of. Uh, of, of negotiating those differences. And I think there's also points to be made about the difference, uh, diff distinctions between strong states and weak states uh, and, and stable and unstable states. Those are two very different so sorts, of, sorts of dichotomies. I mean, we can think of a number of, one of the peculiarities of Rwanda, perhaps in the African context, is that it was still a very, relatively speaking, a strong state, I mean, partly due to its small size, but it would know, be considered to be something of a developmental model. Um, it was a strong but unstable state, as it were, a strong state in a moment of kind of constitutional crisis, if you like, or you know, period of democratization after economic restructuring and a Hutu elite that felt its hold on power being, um, being taken away, so then played up to the broader Hutu population, the prospect of sort of historical loss of power to the historical enemy. You know, that's an interesting example of a relatively strong state in an unstable situation. <laughs> Whereas, you know, you could contrast that with, with, with Darfur and Sudan and say, this is a relatively weak state, much territorially larger, much weaker institutions, much less control over its peripheries. Um, and you could say that the Nazi Germany is a strong state a very strong state. How, I mean, it'd be interesting to say how unstable or stable Nazi Germany was. I mean, clearly a state that relies upon the necessity to go to war, as it clearly did in its ideology and in its economic model. It was based on an expansionism, racist, economic, military, a kind of, um, and at the same time, would we call that an unstable state? I don't know. <laughs> I, it's you know it's a state with, with an incredibly strong state with obvious grip of a small of, of a power elite over its main institutions. It's clearly not pluralistic in any sense. But I do wonder. And this is a very long answer. I suppose it's getting round to, if I if I could be so crass as to make this into my own question, is to to ask all of us looking forward. What we seem to it seems to me that things like climate change, resource scarcity, environmental degradation will play out most strongly and most most dangerously in states with relatively weak infrastructures and it will enhance instability. Um, 
and so it may probably not be worth me talking about Nazism in this sense at all, because it's a very interesting case, but may not have that much relevance to the future going forwards. I'd like to uh, follow up on, on the uh, Nazi Germany case, and which also uh, has some similarities to Russia at the time that Putin took over, and that is the retreat of democracy, that you had the Weimar Republic, which was on paper the most liberal constitution in, in, in all of Europe, perhaps the world, um, although in practice not, probably like France or Belgium in practice, um, and um, it could not it could not stand that so that uh, the retreat of democracy was 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 crucial here um, in in allowing Hindenburg essentially enabling Hitler to take power even though most people don't realize it Hindenburg played a very active role actually in Hitler coming to power um, and and Hindenburg was the president of of, of the German Republic Weimar Republic um, and um, but I, I want to uh, and and Russia the same thing Russian Federation. Um, where the Yeltsin had a major liberal, liberalization program that was failing massively given the, the decline in GDP, GDP per capita uh, and, and the fact that even minimum standards of, of living were not being maintained at the Soviet level. <laughs> With all the lines, people had a minimum, minimum survival, whereas that they were not being able to survive on the amounts of money they were making uh, in the Russian Federation under the Yeltsin's liberalization program. So, and this, and this led to, um, along with the territorial problem of Chechnya, led to Yeltsin appointing Putin and the essentially genocide of, of, of the Chechens uh, to the point of 20% of the, of the population. I wanna mention as a political scientist, and I happened to be at a Zoom meeting this morning with a graduate student of mine, uh, uh, we're talking about state capacity, and that is a variable that's been around in political science for a while, and it's gotten new purchase, I think, uh, precisely for the kinds of things that we've been talking about here, the issue of instability. Okay, thank you guys so much. Um, so I'd like to, again, just thank our panelists for this really fascinating discussion, um, and to all of you joining us in the audience, I would like to extend my thanks for being here tonight. It means a lot both to our panelists and to me that you're dedicating your time and energy to studying such an important topic with us. Um, and with that, we will now split into the breakout rooms with the panelists. So the links to each of those rooms should be in the chat. Um, and let's head over there. <laughs>